Chris Mikowski of Emerging Civil War for the Central Virginia Battlefields Trust, and I'm on the Chancellorsville Battlefield today, walking in the footsteps of Private Henry Fleming from Stephen Crane's novel, The Red Badge of Courage. Now, this is gonna be a particularly tricky task for us today because Stephen Crane didn't want us following in Fleming's footsteps. He intentionally makes Fleming's movements across the battlefield pretty vague. And in fact, in the novel, he doesn't actually mention Chancellorsville as the battle at all. But of course, there are enough clues that help us connect the dots in a later short story, The Veteran. Uh, Crane actually does have Fleming say, yeah, it was Chancellorsville. So we know that uh, the, the novel takes place here. What I'm going to do, rather than literally walk in the footsteps, is take you to some places on the battlefield that evoke some of the scenes in Crane's novel so that you can explore the battlefield, see some things that Crane's character saw, even though Crane himself was never actually here. He was born after the war even happened. Uh, but his writing is so evocative and connects people to the battlefield so successfully that veterans thought that he had been here. They were amazed at the skill in his writing. Behind me is the road that's gonna head up to Ely's Ford. Um, the army's gonna march from that area down into that area, the Chancellorsville intersection, that way just a mile. We know that Henry Fleming goes through two days of fighting in the course of the novel, which means he doesn't actually show up on the battlefield uh, until the 2nd of May. So he misses all of the first day's fighting. So just by that clue, we know that he's either part of uh, one of the final divisions of Couch's 2nd Corps to arrive here, or he's part of Dan Sickles' 3rd Corps. Uh, scholars have done some work and have identified some particular regiments that maybe Fleming might have belonged to, uh, but the novel says he belongs to the 304th New York, which is completely fictitious. Its uh, exploits do relate to some actions that took place here and some specific regiments that took place here, and we'll go visit some of those over the course of our tour. But we know that Fleming starts the story in this area here around the Bullock House and then will eventually go into the fight on the morning of May 2nd. He does so, it is, his unit moves around, they get positioned, repositioned, shifted, they cross a small creek, uh, they have time to eat lunch before they ever even see their first fighting. And it's in that first fighting that Fleming first realizes that uh, maybe he's not quite cut out for this. He's been wondering about that for the whole first part of the novel. He finally sees the elephant and he flees. And his adventures are gonna take him deep into the heart of the battlefield, off in that direction. And we're gonna go find some places that look like and sound like some of the places Fleming runs across. But first, let's take a look here at the Bullock Farm. This was a farmstead owned by Oscar and Catherine Bullock. They had two infant kids. Uh, at the time of the war, uh, Oscar was actually off serving in the Confederate Army. Um, also living here was Catherine's younger brother, David Kyle, 19 years old at the time of the Battle of Chancellorsville, best known as the guide who takes Stonewall Jackson down the mountain road for his appointment with destiny. We're gonna take a walk from the Bullock Farm and the apex of Hooker's Last Line down the Chancellorsville History Trail and uh, see some parts of the wilderness that actually look like the wilderness. As Henry Fleming is fleeing from the battle and he's pushing his way across the battlefield and away from the lines, he gets entangled in some areas that are pretty wild. He sees why this is actually called the Virginia Wilderness. And you can still see that too by taking a walk down this trail. The forest at Chancellorsville is much more mature than it had been in 1863. We see much taller trees, a lot less undergrowth, um, and so we've got a mature forest, not the second growth, dense, deciduous jungle that soldiers saw during the Battle of Chancellorsville. If you take a look at this stretch of forest, notice that the trees are a lot smaller, um, they're a lot shorter, a lot of dense undergrowth, things are pretty thick, everything's fighting for that sunlight. The ground was cluttered with vines and bushes, Crane writes, and the trees grew close and spread out like bouquets. The creepers, catching against his legs, cried out harshly as their sprays were torn from the barks of trees. And elsewhere, he says, the brambles formed chains and tried to hold him back. Trees confronting him stretched out their arms and forbade him to pass. The Chancellorsville History Trail 
is 3.6 miles long. It's a big loop that goes from the visitor center out to the Chancellorsville Mansion up past Hooker Drive and down to the Bullock House in through the forest along the trenches and then brings you eventually back down to the visitor center. And there's also a half mile loop on the other side of the visitor center. A uh, great place to uh, really get a sense of what the wilderness might have looked like once upon a time. I know this is supposed to be a history video, but I'm gonna take a second to have a little nature moment because one of the cool things you can see on this part of the trail in particular are these little funnel spiders. Take a look right over here. You can see one of their funnels. They create these funnels and they wait for prey to be caught in that web and then they wait down in the mouth of that. These things can be huge. Now, if I were to continue along that path, it would bring me out here along Hooker Drive. You can see the park's maintenance building right across the road. There are some great earthworks off to the woods in this direction. This would have been where Darius Couch's second core would have been located along Hooker Drive across what today is uh, Route 3 and up paralleling uh, the edge of what we now call uh, the McClaws Wedge, ground preserved by CVBT. I could go through the novel and make an argument that uh, Henry Fleming's 304th New York Regiment was actually somewhere along this part of the line, uh, part of Samuel Carroll's brigade in William Blinky French's division. And I always got to give extra blinks for Blinky French. And, um, uh, uh, but of course to Stephen Crane, that was all rather irrelevant. He didn't care about placing Fleming in an actual regiment. Uh, he didn't want us distracted by some of those particulars because he knew some Yahoo like me would be out here trying to walk in the footsteps. And that was uh, beside the point for Crane. I can't stress that enough. Um, as we'll see though, there's probably some compelling evidence that, uh, that Fleming's 304th was based on a different unit in the third corps, but we could make that uh, argument that they were here. And that's one of the things I think is genius about Crane's work is that it does sort of transcend specifics uh, and allows us to tap into universes. I'm on a different part of the trail now across from the Bullock House site, but this time going through the woods in the opposite direction. And uh, one of my favorite parts of the novel is where Henry Fleming finds himself in a cathedral of trees. And he has to push himself through some pines in order to get to this cathedral. There aren't many pine stands left that you could push your way through on the battlefield now, but you can see above me that there are still uh, some tall ones these days. In fact, the woods of Chancellorsville and uh, the wilderness are filled with these tall Virginia pines. They've got very shallow root systems, and so they're vulnerable to weather. Um, strong, uh, strong storms can push them over. A lot of them have been heat weakened this particular summer, and a few have toppled. Um, but here we can, along this stretch of the path, we can actually see that cathedral of trees with the sun dappling down through, and it's just a, a gorgeous little spot. You can see there are actually some earthworks behind me, some lunettes, uh, not very commonly visited here on this part of the battlefield, but all along the stretch of the path as you go through, um, you can see some works as the army stared at each other on May 3rd and 4th. It's a very different sort of forest then we were just walking through much taller trees here. And again, this would not have necessarily been the case at the wilderness um, during the Battle of Chancellorsville. Uh, but that one scene is so evocative as Fleming pushes his way into that cathedral. Now, what Henry finds when he pushes his way in there uh, presents one of the most sublime moments of the whole novel. He finds the body of a dead Union soldier who's blue uniform has aged such that it has turned green. It's not something that you would have found here in the wilderness at the time. Um, you would have found in the wilderness 1864, but the armies had not been to this part of Virginia in 1863. So who was the soldier? How did he get here? Uh, was he a deserter? If so, he's on the wrong side of the river from where the Union encampment was all winter long. So it's a real mystery, um, but it is the sort of thing soldiers would have seen in 1864 and young Crane growing up would have heard stories about from veterans telling their tales. So it's something that he worked in here. It's a cool little mystery, uh, but it also provides a pretty interesting tension at that moment, uh, juxtaposing the beauty of the woods against the horror of this corpse with insects crawling on its face. The stretch of the trail I'm on, just up a little farther from where I was, uh, the uh, Ely's Four Road is just behind me right there. I can actually see uh, uh, street signs and hear cars. So we're just off the, uh, the road 
Uh, even though cars going by wouldn't know that uh, the path is, is quite so close. I'm over by the Chancellorsville intersection now. Uh, modern day Route 3 riding behind me, east to west there. The road to the river here at Ely's Ford Road right here. And off beyond uh, through the intersection is the old Plank Road. Uh, the Plank Road and the Turnpike each get mentioned once in the novel. And as folks familiar with the battlefield know, in places the Plank Road and the Turnpike are the same road. So it's really hard to use those as reference points. And that's one of the things that makes it hard to locate Fleming on the battlefield, regardless of where his unit was. Uh, when he wanders away on that first day, um, he gets far away from the battle, so, so much so that it's, it's quiet in the distance. Um, it's hard to do that here on this battlefield without crossing one of these roads, which Fleming doesn't seem to do until later in the day. Um, so that's one reason why it becomes then sort of impossible to really trace his footsteps. Again, for Crane, that's not really the point. Um, but it does make it hard if people who are taking things literally to try to uh, situate Fleming somewhere on the field. A couple times, Crane writes about the road to the river. That would have been off in that direction. But he also talks about the road to the rear. And if we're at Chancellorsville and the fighting is taking place in that direction, moving in this direction toward the camera then becomes moving toward the rear. So again, it can be kind of confusing uh, as far as battlefield orientation. As Fleming continues to make his way through the woods across the battlefield, Crane writes that he once found himself almost in a swamp. He was obliged to walk upon bog tufts and watch his feet to keep from the oily mire. There are a couple spots like that on the battlefield, low places that collect water. And uh, here's a spot along the Chancellorsville Wilderness Trail, about two tenths of a mile in from the Chancellorsville Clearing. Uh, we can find another such spot down by Lewis Run near Catherine Furnace off Furnace Road. Now, if he is sloshing through the water down near Lewis Run, we're pretty far away from where we started this tour. Um, Crane does give Fleming the chance to wander through the battlefield. He gets far enough away from the fighting that he can't actually hear the sound of it. It grows dim in the background. Um, so perhaps uh, he got his way down here, or perhaps he actually started here and wandered his way up. One of the units that uh, Crane modeled Fleming's experiences on is the 124th New York, the Orange Blossoms. The Orange Blossoms came from Orange County, New York, right where the northernmost tip of New Jersey meets Pennsylvania and New York. A little town there called Port Jervis was Crane's hometown, and the 124th was mustered from that area. If the experiences of the 304th New York were based on those of the orange blossoms, then they would have come from that area around the Bullock Farm, down past the Chancellorsville Mansion, westward along the Turnpike, and then down over Hazel Grove into this area, coming from that direction, then down toward uh, Catherine's Furnace. They would have been part of the force used to attack Stonewall Jackson's marching column as it went on its flank march. Now this is going to be the first time that Fleming's unit is ever engaged. So they don't necessarily have a scale for what a big fight looks like. But this first fight seems bad enough for Fleming that he gets scared and then rationalizes an excuse to uh, desert and he runs off into the forest. The fighting here by the uh, Orange Blossom, the 124th New York, would have carried him down in that direction. They would have been facing the 23rd Georgia under the command of Colonel uh, Emery Best. Um, eventually, the Georgians would have been overwhelmed and it would have been a pretty stout resistance. So enough for the Federals to feel like they were kind of in the thick of things and certainly enough to scare Fleming off. So that's one scenario that might have put him down on this sector of the battlefield by Catherine Furnace, the ruins of which you can see behind me there. Regardless of what unit Henry is with, his wanderings on the battlefield near dusk on May 2nd do bring him to this area on the Chancellorsville battlefield. Off in that direction is Hazel Grove. The visitor center is directly across the street. In that direction is Chancellorsville, about a mile away, and in that direction uh, is Germaniford, the wilderness. He finds himself here and talks about the charge of the 8th Pennsylvania Cavalry. He doesn't mention the unit by name, but it is the only cavalry charge that happens during the battle. It achieved much attention over the course of the years. 
It's also at this point in the novel that Henry encounters fleeing refugees from the attack of Stonewall Jackson on the 11th Corps. They would be coming from that direction into that direction. He receives his red badge of courage when one of those fleeing refugees, speaking in an accent in the novel, hits him with the butt of his rifle. So now Henry has an excuse when he goes back to his regiment to say that uh, he got separated and, and hurt in the fight instead of just ran away. He'll earn that badge during the fighting, of course, the next day. So we don't know exactly where uh, he was when he receives that wound, but he know, we know it's on this road. We know that he saw the charge of the Pennsylvanians. He also makes mention of the fact that the fight that he was engaged with earlier, which may have been the fight at Catherine Furness down in that direction, seemed like a mere skirmish compared to the sound that erupted on the Union right, which would have been off in that direction as Stonewall Jackson, pushing his way that way, uh, finally slams into the Union flank. There are several instances where they talk about off on the right, off on the right, or where, where Crane mentions uh, hearing fighting off on the right. Um, so it's generally considered to be off in that direction so that helps place and situate what's going on. Henry Fleming actually finds his regiment on the evening of May 2nd and they settle in. He's got some quiet and peace. Um, but of course, on the night of May 2nd, uh, Dan Sickles of the Third Corps launch a night attack, which is actually kind of disastrous because uh, Sickles runs into members of the 12th Corps off in that direction. Um, either way, on the morning of the 3rd, the regiment does find itself in action again. The Orange Blossoms would have been off in that direction. And even as James Archer's Confederate Brigade was sweeping up in this direction, Sickles had received orders from Joe Hooker to withdraw back to the main federal line, which is off now in that direction. So the Third Corps is starting to pull back. As a result, the Orange Blossoms find themselves just beyond that little rise over there, um, caught between the lines as Archer's men come up. And the regimental history talks about it being a very hot place. Um, and, and things are, are a pretty tight contest there. And it makes the, the men of the regiment realize that the fight that they had been in the day before uh, was probably nothing more than a light skirmish compared to the intensity of this battle. They are going to be able to extricate themselves from that area, sweep down off in that direction and find themselves some protection with the main line. But no sooner do they do than they're actually ordered back in as a charge to help hold the Confederates back while the rest of the Third Corps makes its withdrawal. Uh, it's a even more intense action. The colonel says that they thought they'd been in a hot place over there, and when they get over to the uh, the new line, it becomes even hotter. In fact, they're going to lose about uh, 200 and. Uh, 20 or so men out of about 550, roughly a 36% casualty rate. So a pretty intense. But what's most significant about that action is that the regiment in the novel goes through the same crisis of faith that Henry Fleming had the day before. Henry finds himself in the crucible of battle, finds himself wanting, and he flees into the woods. He later finds his courage, comes back, and he proves himself in the fight on that morning of May 3rd. Meanwhile, in that fight, the regiment itself begins to waver and has its crisis of faith, uh, and they actually pull back. They're mocked by some of the veterans, but they find their fighting spirit later in the day and uh, put up uh, a, a almost demonic fight. Um, Henry Fleming, in the, over the course of the day, after uh, running in fear the day before, is lauded for his bravery on the battlefield. The colonel sees him and says, that man is a Jim Dandy. Uh, the Orange Blossoms, as I mentioned earlier, fantastic regiment. They're going to have five Medal of Honor recipients come out of that, uh, uh, including um, one who's going to earn it right here at Chancellorsville. Um, uh, Jim Conklin, a character in the novel, is actually based on a real private Jim Conklin, who was a member of the 124th. Um, in the novel, Jim Conklin dies, but in real life, uh, Jim Conklin goes back to Port Jervis and lives out a happy retirement. After the 304th extricates itself from Hazel Grove, which from here is going to be in that direction there, um, they're going to fall back here to Fairview, where there's going to be a pretty intense concentration of federal infantry and artillery. There are going to be 34 federal artillery pieces here, squaring off against about 40 Confederate artillery pieces back there at Hazel Grove. Now, in the real live footsteps of the 124th, 
they're actually going to be posted right over there behind me uh, along the road. So they're going to see some pretty intense fighting back and forth. In the novel, the 304th involved in that sort of fighting is going to redeem its honor after the ill-fated charge earlier in the day. So things are going to get pretty tough. Um, this area, of course, sees intense fighting. It's the epicenter of the federal position, and as Confederates keep hammering and hammering and hammering here, eventually, as these artillery pieces start to run out of ammunition, the federal army is going to start to fall back toward Chancellorsville in that direction. Now, we can place Henry Fleming here because he talks about the Chancellorsville mansion, and he talks about these guns that were over here. If his unit is posted along the road there, he talks about the guns off on the slope to his left. And he talks about the Chancellorsville mansion behind him, a big white mansion with a row of horses tethered out front. So we can pretty clearly identify where he's at in the battlefield. Eventually, as the Union Army pulls out and begins its withdrawal, uh, Henry Fleming's unit pulls out in really good order. They march away pretty spectacularly and smoothly. And if you consider the chaos going on at the moment uh, in the middle of the battle on May 3rd, uh, not a whole lot of units necessarily were able to pull out in good order. But Darius Couch does a pretty magnificent job saving this army, pulling it back. Um, he's got some good help from Henry Slocum, and uh, they prevent a rout with a fairly um, organized, um, if a bit pressured, withdrawal back past Chancellorsville, up Ely's Ford Road, toward what today is known as Hooker's Last Line. Before we leave uh, Fairview, let's just take a quick look around here. We'll go over here to the location of the overseer's house that once stood here. Just beyond there is the old Chancellor's Cemetery. There are 25 headstones there today. Uh, there had been a white picket fence that surrounded the cemetery at the time of the battle. If we go over here, there are some pretty interesting lunettes to take a look at. A lunette, a half moon shaped fortification used to protect an artillery piece. One of the interesting things out here at Fairview is the sort of competing lines of lunettes. These ones all face south. They were dug on May 1st, as Federals were expecting if there was gonna be any Confederate attack had come from the south in that direction. But when things start coming from the southwest and the west, they realign their position and uh, change their gun pits pretty hastily. When the 304th is at Hazel Grove, Crane writes that they can actually see in one cleared space there was a row of guns making gray clouds which were filled with large flashes of orange colored flame. Probably talking about these guns right here. Over some foliage, they could see the roof of a house, perhaps the overseer's house, perhaps the Chancellorsville mansion off in the distance. One window glowing a deep murder red shone squarely through the leaves. Another nature moment real quick, hard to see, but there's a flock of turkeys in this field I've been watching all summer. We're gonna wrap up right across the street from where we started. This is the apex of Hooker's Last Line. If we were to go across the street, the Bullock Farm is over there. That's where we began today. There is um, Bullock Road. It takes us down to the visitor center, except it's one way, so you can only come this way. You can't go that way. Uh, but here at the apex of Hooker's Line, at the end of the novel, Henry Fleming and his, his regiment actually march on the road back to the river, which is then gonna take them up in that direction. Now they've been fighting for two days. As we know, the Battle of Chancellorsville started May 1st. Henry Fleming gets in here. After that truck goes by, Henry Fleming gets here into the fight on the second. He uh, proves himself on the third, and then late in the day, he marches to the rear. But we all know that uh, the, the action here at Chancellorsville takes place also on the fourth as action shifts down towards Salem Church. Lee marches back in the fifth, ready to attack, but that's when the Union Army finally heads across the river. But it's important to note that uh, even though the novel makes it sound like that uh, Fleming is on the road to the river, that road right there, they don't actually cross. Uh, and that's because Fleming has learned the lesson he needs to learn. He's come to the epiphany he needs to come to. And so Crane's able to end the novel without actually taking Fleming off the battlefield. So he, like the rest of the army, pulls back on the 3rd of May past the apex into a more consolidated position, able to get there in good order. And uh, as he does so, 
the novel comes to its conclusion. And with that, that brings to an end our time on the Chancellorsville battlefield as well. Hopefully you've seen some things today that help bring to life some of Crane's prose. I urge you to read the book if you haven't, uh, because it's a wonderful book, but then also come out on the battlefield and explore, and you'll see some of the things that Crane helped readers see. See some of the things his character Henry Fleming saw, or some of the types of things. Nothing beats being out on the battlefield. But for readers of Crane's Red Badge of Courage, a lot of them thought that that book was the next best thing. I'm Chris Mikowski of Emerging Civil War for the Central Virginia Battlefields Trust.